this is episode 55 of the Wildlife Photography Q&A video series in which we answer your wildlife photography questions. I have with me, Johan, let's we say yes. that. <laughs> Hi everybody, yeah, thanks Jerry, nice to be uh, back in the studio with you again. It's, it's been a while, I think last year was the, was the last time that we were actually in this uh, studio I, together. Did we do the, because th this, this uh, video series has been renewed, yeah. and this is the second time that we're hosting together. Yes. Yeah? Yes. Okay. Um, yes, second time also with the new intro, with the new logos and everything, so mm. pretty exciting times. I know you and Krista worked very hard behind the scenes to get the new intro together, and I think yeah. it looks amazing. It is. I mean, for you guys, when you watch this tomorrow, for you guys on live, um, if you're on live, we've got to, we're filming this live as well. For the people on live, tell <laughs> Michael, who's on my feed, what you think of the new intro. It's pretty sick, I think. Mm. It's just a new refreshing, it's part of the new logo, it's a new look and feel, but the content we're producing for you guys is still... The same. So, um, on your hands feed, my feed, and on the wildlife feed, we ask you guys for questions in wildlife photography. We have loads. There's way more than just the 10 we're going to answer. What we spoke about with Trevor and stuff as well is we're going to take some of these and create standalone pieces of content for you. Um, we're not traveling as much as we want to. We'll get to that. But um, here we go. Wildlife Q&A episode 55 starts now. The washing basket is too full and you boys eat too much. When are you traveling again? I don't even know how to answer that. I think it's, um, it's a bit bitchy, to be honest. <laughs> um, no, but, it, you know, it, it's, it's quite an interesting thing. People often see the, the romantic side of what we do. You know, they, they, they see the traveling, they see the uh, amazing experiences, the wildlife and things. Mm. But, they don't actually see the, um, the behind the scenes and the, the family stuff that, that goes with it. You yeah. know, whether, you know, both have their challenges. When we're traveling like 180, <coughs> 190 days a year, you know, there is, you need a strong relationship mm. to be able to, to make that work. And I think what's been the challenge for a lot of us now is, you know, when you're traveling, and I, I'm not saying it's the case with any of us, but, you know, if your, your relationship isn't strong, it's, when you're traveling, it's, you have, for a day or two and then you're gone again and it's fine mm. whereas you know if, you, if you're not strong now all of a sudden you're together for three four five we've been together now for like a year without traveling you know it changes <laughs> from a mindset point of view it changes a lot you know 100%. so i think we, we're very lucky that we've got partners that um that you know that know what we do and yeah. it's a strong relationship but <clears throat> people don't get the the sort of the challenges that you face from a relationship point of view when you're traveling and when you're not traveling. It is hard. I mean, I was I did a coffee. Um, I do these morning coffee videos, mm -hmm. and I was talking about travel stories this morning. And I think this is the longest I should you not that I haven't traveled in about fifteen years. Yeah. Because before this, it was there was gymnastics, there was working on the ships, there was working on islands and stuff. And it's scary how you fall into a routine now. But it makes you also appreciate how difficult it is to travel all the time. Yeah. I mean, the one thing, if you, like, you go away, you have a partner, if you phone them all the time and say to them, what's up, what's up, what's up, you come home from a trip. Judy, I hope you're listening. You come home from a trip and you don't want to necessarily talk about things immediately. Yeah. Because you're tired. Yeah. You just want to zone out. But, and I've had this with even my parents, we come home and it's like, oh, how to go? What did you see? I'm just, just. Let's go, let's go out for dinner. Just, and let's, yeah. I've been dinnering and drinking with people for the last month. Yeah, exactly. Back it up. So, when are we traveling again? When's yours? Uh, on paper, April, uh, but it's to India. So, we're still waiting to see what's going to happen with mm. the, the Indian borders. Um, other than that, I think May in yeah. the big way. Yeah. I'm also, I think I'm also May, um, Svalbard. And also, we're waiting for the boats. As soon as the boats confirm whether they're running or not, then we are back in. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm going to leave the washing basket and you eating too much at home for you and Judy to discuss. Yeah, that's... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> and, um, yeah, we'll update you guys in these videos as well when we travel. So just stay tuned. Yeah. Next one. What has been your most memorable experience? Um, I think the one moment for me that stands out is it was in the Great Bear Rainforest in British Columbia. Not last year because we didn't travel. I think it was 2018. And on the last two days of the trip, we went to a place called Gribble Island. And it's where you get spirit bears. There's only about between three and 400 of these animals in the world. So a spirit bear is a, is a black bear with a double recessive gene. And they come out white. So it's still considered a black bear. And we're in this creek. So it's this beautiful creek up to the sides. I mean, it's the stuff you see like in 
movies, Legends of the Fall, or those guys. It's just stunning, right? And this one spirit bear came past three or four times because they'll, they'll walk on the outside up and then they go down the river. So they're hunting salmon. So as the salmon comes up, they hunt them. And that dead quietness in that setting with this animal, which is less than 400 in the world, it was dead quiet. I only heard the shutters of my clients. That to me is easily in my top three. There's more in Svalba, but I think I have to pick one now. That will be it. Yeah. Yours? It's a tough one. I've given it some thought. And I think um, my top two that I can think of now actually is not wildlife related. Um, it is safari related. I think the one that stands out for me was when I was guiding in Medikwe. We were driving along uh, Moloteri Main Road, so mm -hmm. going towards Flay Pan. And yeah. Some idiot threw his beer bottle um, out of his car. Luckily, we, we, I mean, we didn't see him doing it, but we saw the bottle on the road. And, you know, for, for me, it was something simple just to sort of get out the vehicle and pick it up. And I was guiding a, a family that had a, a kid, I think he was like seven or eight years old. And then when he went back home to the States, when he was walking around in the city, like every paper and things he saw, he picked up and put it in the Because of that? Because of that. And okay. I think often you, as a guide, you don't realize the impact that you have on people. You know? And yeah. I think the second thing for me would be, and it, it, it never gets old, and it, it's almost moment that you wait for is after the morrow week when people say goodbye and you see the tears flowing sure. and whether it be at the camp or at the at the airstrip i 100%. think you know that for me just gives that mm. um a bit of satisfaction it sounds horrible to see people cry and you get satisfaction out of it but yeah. it makes you realize that you know what you've done during yeah. that week has been life-changing for people 100 <laughs> percent. i remember last year when we closed camp i was there for the last week mm. and um john the, the year before and that <laughs> so John has sent me this email to read to the staff because we're now closing camp this is the last week so I'm up there I've got to read this emotional thing to the staff mm. and it's like oh. okay guys it's difficult mm. but it's, I think it's a physical representation of how you feel and yeah. like you say to see that with people is just amazing yeah. absolutely amazing uh, next one your top five animals you haven't photographed yet doesn't have to be in Africa Okay, top five in the world. Let's go one by one. My first one, uh, coastal wolves. I've come close, but not yet. Polar bears. Um, Komodo dragons. Spirit bears. Damn it. <laughs> um, what else? Um, Bengal tigers. Grizzly bears. <laughs> Snow leopards. Red panda. Okay. Um, and emperor penguins. Jaguar. Done. It's a proper solid list that. Yeah, I did <laughs> What is the trickiest wildlife photo you've ever tried to shoot? Yo, I think I mean gorillas is always always quite tricky, you know, in that um, that <laughs> rainforest, um, very dark. Funny enough, I had the same sort of challenges in India. I found India also quite challenging. Also, those forests quite dark, mm. um, and also you know if. Like midday tigers, you know, they've got some dark in them, they've got some white in their faces. So from exposure point of view, I think they can be, can be quite tricky to photograph. Oh, that balance. I think, I mean, any primate always, because of where they find themselves, in thickets or bushes and stuff, to me the most tricky one, who's asking, wandering souls there, is, was gibbons in Borneo. So gibbon is the only truly arboreal primate in the world. They never come on the floor. Mm. They just live in the trees. So you go out in the morning and they come from where they're roosted, but now you're photographing in these monster trees up at a bright sky, so you've got dappled light through, these things move like nothing, they swing like Spider-Man, try and focus, exposure, it was a nightmare. It is, it is probably the most difficult thing I've ever tried to photograph. Yeah. But experience-wise, shit, it's nice. Yeah. I think another one also is the, the carmine bee-eaters, oh, from, from, from those hides, you know, they, they are, they're the most amazing birds, and it's, it's, you get super close to them, but to get them in flight yeah. and things, man, those things are fast. You need patience. Yeah. A lot of patience. Yeah. <laughs> All right, next one. Why don't you guys follow me? Just joking. What's the easiest app for editing if you are a beginner? Why should I follow you? No, I'm joking. I'm joking. What do you do? Send me a direct message and I will come and follow you, but you have to keep on producing good content, otherwise I'm leaving. And also then I'll share it on my story. Mm. And we'll give you some follows if that helps. What's the easiest app for editing? I would say Lightroom. Lightroom. If you're starting from scratch, Lightroom is the easiest. Yeah, 100%. If it's a problem from a money point of view, there are other options like, oh man, dad, my dad told me about it now. 
Um, but yes. it's an $89 once-off, not a subscription model. Very Lightroom-esque. Yeah. But between Lightroom and Photoshop, mm. one answer. Or when, if you, I, mean, I don't know if you're talking about editing from a, from a laptop or from a phone, because you can get Snapseed on your phone. Amazing. And that also works, works wonders. So, yeah. And I, I don't even think it costs that much, if anything. Snapseed's free. Yeah, Snapseed's yeah. free. So Snapseed's free. All right, next one. Is wildlife photography your full-time job? If so, how do you become one? Good answers, yes. Um, and it, I think a lot of people see the, the wildlife photography again, what we do as just being out in the field and having holidays, what people call it. There, yeah. there's, there's so much more to that. You know, there's, I think, first of all, what we pride ourselves in is the guiding experience. So we've all worked at lodges. We've all sort of worked with people. I think that's also very important, mm. the, the love for, for people. Um, and, you know, then the work that goes into it, the planning of the safaris and then getting the people on safaris, you know, that's, so it, it's, it's not just photographing wildlife, you know, it's, um, it's more about the people and creating mm. the experiences for them. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's a full-time job. We're in the office, mm. well, no, not so much, but we're working Monday to Friday, yeah. 365. I think, I think where a lot of people miss the point is that when they talk about is wildlife photography a full-time job? Yes. Mm. What we do is wildlife photography. However, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, I don't see myself as a full-time wildlife photographer. No. That's where a lot of people make the mistake. They think that they can quit their job, they can buy a camera, they can go and take pictures of a lion and make a shit ton of money and travel. doesn't work anymore. Those days are gone. In the old days when, yeah. when your barrier to entry was the, the price of camera equipment, yeah. that's gone. Yeah. So every Tom, Dick and Harry now goes to the Kruger, puts this big ass lens out the window, posts images on Instagram and looks amazing. So, and they're a wildlife photographer. Oh yeah, they're a wildlife photographer. <laughs> yes, they're a wildlife photographer. So I think it's, it's, it's just defining what it is in wildlife photography that you want to do a job. Uh, how do you become one? Start. Yeah. I have people asking, they're sitting in an office in Tokyo saying, I want to be a wildlife photographer. They've never looked at wildlife, photograph wildlife. Just start. Buy a camera, photograph wildlife and go from there. Yeah, 100%. I think nowadays there's so much available for you online that there really are no excuses. Like Jerry said, get a camera, get out in the field, start photographing and go from there. That's it. Next one. If your main goal is to maximize diversity of species you'll see, which safari location is best? It might sound cliched uh, and we go there often, but I think the Masai Mara uh, for a couple of reasons. The visual ability to see far is amazing. Um, the big mammals that you find there is plentiful um, and it's almost easy. Look, I used to do a thing with clients when I went, when I was lodge based and I would say to them, okay, cool, listen, let's count big mammals, not elephant shrews and three striped dormice and stuff like that. Anything basically from like, um, not even mongoose, like from a, a steenbuck up, mm. count big mammals. If you get, help me if I'm right, between 18 and 20 mm. big mammals, like big five zebra, wildebeest, you're doing pretty well. Yeah. And I reckon in the Mara you can do that every single time. So, easy answer for me, I think, would be the Mara. Yeah, Mara is a very good option. Also, I think South Africa also is, um, gives you that option. The, if you go to places like Medikwe, Sabi Sands, you know, there is a good chance. Luckily, at this stage, um, South Africa still has a good um, rhino population, mm. as things stand. Um, and also the variety of general game, I think, is also very good. So those will be the two, two options. That's the thing, just on a sideline. For those of you planning a safari, speak to the people you're booking with. Because if you want to see a gorilla and they sell you a trip to the Mara, not happening. Okay, We've had people saying, hey, I've got a crooked trip. Can you please book me a day trip to see the gorillas? No. So I think... To manage your own expectations as to what you want to see and how much and the diversity you want to see, that's important. Mm. But Mara and South Africa. Done. I know it's about practice, but how do I find the perfect settings for bad light or movement? Um, Julia, I'm not sure I'm understanding the question 100%, but whenever people ask, how do I perfect the settings for, you should stop the question right there because the answer will always be go back to basics. Understand aperture, shutter speed, ISO, how they work together. Understand exposure, compensation, light or darker, how that affects your shutter speed. So for me, go back to basics because if you understand the basics of photography, you should be able to manage that. Yeah, 100%. You know, and I think a lot of the time people ask for, people want like a shortcut, you know, what 
should my settings be for a, a sunset or mm. for a, a action scene? It like Jerry says, you can't you can't sort of give a like a solid sort of number and say that's what your setting should be. If you understand ISO shutter speed and aperture, mm. and then also afterwards exposure compensation, then you can end up creating what you want to create. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, I think it's like anything. I mean, if we if we look at something like health and fitness, if you read up on how exercise works and how joints and muscles work, you'll know how to do something. You're not going to do a squat and hope to get bigger biceps. So it might be a stupid analogy, but still, understand the basics of anything that you're trying to do. Not only will it be more fun, but you'll have better results. Yeah. How did you start your photographic journey and what did you find most challenging then and now? So I think for myself, very similar to a lot of uh, the guys in the office here, the, it was first the, the guiding side of it and the, again the, the guest experience side of it. The photography grew later on, you know, as you in the wild and you know, in these amazing places documenting your journey, photography just sort of um, becomes a natural mm. process almost and got more and more serious as, as time went on. I think the biggest challenge for me was um, back at that time to just to find, mm. you know, the, just the lack of information that was out there from a wildlife photography point of view. Yeah. I think that, that was really difficult. And then I think also to, you know, moving on later as a photographic guide, the, the marketing side um, of yourself and, you know, with, within the company that you work with. I think that's, that's something that I think a lot of people try and rush into. And you've got to give yourself maybe like five years to, um, mm. as a sort of as a time frame yeah. before you really start getting busy. I think that's important. I think a lot of guys want to leave the lodge, mm. do the private guiding and expect to be busy right from the word go and traveling the whole world where it doesn't really work that way. Not well. at all. Yeah. Um, I think for me, it started, so I was working on Queen Mary 2, managing health and wellness and I, I think I've told this on some of my blogs and stuff, but a, a friend of mine, Glenn, and I both bought a little Sony camera. Mm. It was a little, it was as big as my iPhone is, right? <laughs> And we started photographing because you wake up in New York and Rio and um, Sivitavecchia or whatever. Mm. And we started taking pictures. It became a pissing contest initially. Yeah. I'm no, fuck you, mine's better, whatever. Yeah. So that happened. And then I started going into it. I bought my first camera in Gibraltar. And it was a Nikon at the time because it was the cheapest one I could afford. And then I just went down a rabbit hole. Um, so most of it for me was based on travel and people. City photography, people photography, travel photography. Um, I went deeper, I did education, I did a course through New York Institute of Photography just as a correspondence thing. But then when I came back to South Africa and I went to the lodge industry again, that's when it just, wildlife met photography and it went. The challenge I think for me back then, same as yours, was the lack of information. You could not, you guys starting out now are so lucky with the stuff out there. Not just the reproducing, Google, anything. Um, so that was a challenge back then. And I think now... This might sound strange, but I think it's to keep motivation, to keep pushing, trying new things. Because after a while, and it's not like I take anything for granted, but you almost become numb to sighting. So you're creating very good images, but it doesn't fulfill you. There's the spark's gone. So I can create it. I can go to the Mara now and do a kick-ass portfolio. As can you, Trevor. We, we can all do this. It's not difficult. But the deep burning fire inside that makes me want to try new things, that's my challenge now. Now we're going deep. But yeah. that's a thing. It is a thing. It's a thing. Let's just have a moment of silence after that. Okay, next have one. Have a sip of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> next. Will there be any impact on the safari industry going forward due to the pandemic, at least 2021 or 2022, like the number of people sharing vehicles or lodges? 100%. I think um, already some of the lodges that we've, we've spoken to are reducing numbers of people on, <coughs> on vehicles. I think the, a bigger challenge as well, you know, during this pandemic is for those lodges to just keep going, for those mm. wildlife areas to just keep going. And it, it might sound, um, sound terrible, but it, it's a harsh reality that, you know, we've, we've seen it in the last couple of months. Mm. Uh, our poaching has increased. Uh, places like Virunga yeah. have been hit hard. Uh, rhino poaching through, throughout Africa has increased. Mm. So it, it, it's definitely a, a big concern, you know, without, and that's what a lot of people don't understand is, Without tourism, these places can't survive. You know, every bit of money that you put in mm. to a safari goes to that conservation, helps pays um, salaries for these these guys that sacrifice their lives in protecting the mm. the, the wildlife. So, just to sort of uh, 
no, veer off a little bit, but if you've planned a safari, if you've booked a safari, um, and you can't, it can't go ahead this year or maybe even next year, mm. just try and keep postponing those safaris. I think mm. it, it's so important for us. It's a, it's a big message that we want to get out. And it's not about us as guides or us as a company or um, you as a, as, a, as, a, as a person. It's about you know, saving these um, wild protected areas that we so dearly mm. love. I think, I think the one thing that people must understand, and I, I don't know if I showed you, this is about, yo, it's end of last year when we went into lockdown or something again. There was a video on, from the South African Tourism Board, and this guy spoke, and this is true, think about this. So these lodges now, and now is the time to go, because imagine the Masai Mara, can, there can be a lot of people. Yeah. Right? Now there's not many people. So at the best of times, if, if you and I had to go to Thornybush or Sangita or London Lozi, and we take some of you guys with, Think of the amount of people you're going to be in touch with once you get here, right? Because it's either a private plane or a private transfer, so it's just us. You get to the lodge, you have your own vehicle. So it's very, it's, it's low volume people with wide open spaces. Or you can go to France, go to the Louvre and look at the Mona Lisa. Now you're going to have 400 people standing this close to each other, COVID for everybody, while you're doing that. So I think Europe and the US, and I'm not dissing it, I love New York, make no mistake, I love the US. And to travel there. But if you look at the density of people when they travel versus what you get on a safari, it's already, it's already in favor of not seeing and being in touch with many people. Yeah. Um, like you said, I think the lodges are going to be changing things um, from a vehicle point of view. They, they might have put six people on a vehicle, now they put four. But then again, it comes down to you understanding and speaking to us and saying, listen, I'm stressed. I want to book a private vehicle, yeah. which means it's you and mom and dad and grandpa, whatever. Yeah. So it's just you guys. Um, but I think, look, either way we cut it, COVID has changed the world and travel specifically. Interesting thing, like Johan was saying, think of what's happening to these places. I mean, Virunga, terrible stuff happens because of COVID, there's no people. If COVID, and if we don't start looking at ways to manage travel in this time, the global travel industry is in deep shit. Yeah. Like, huge. I spoke to Brendan this morning. Um, he's in, he's flying from Auckland now to, what did he say, LA and then driving across country. But so, some, some people think they're not going to travel for the next year or two. Yeah. And think again, like you said, it's not just the people you buy the airplane ticket from. Yeah. It's the transfers. It's the hotel you're staying at. It's the lodge, the conservation, and, 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 and. So it has changed and it will keep on changing. Yeah. Is Safari still an amazing destination because of not getting in touch with many people? Absolutely. But, I mean, it has changed. It's yeah. And I think, I mean, if, if you guys are out there and you, you want to go on safari, but you're not sure about the protocols um, that are in place, I mean, we, we've gone to a few lodges now, whether it be with guests <coughs> or just doing content, and the protocols that they've put in place is incredible. So the, the staff wear, wear masks. I mean, like Jerry said, there's social distancing all over, and, you know, you've got wide open spaces, so there's no better place to, um, to social distance, actually, yeah, anywhere in the world, really. Mm, 100%. And that's the questions for this week. Um, like I said, there are quite a few questions on this list that we're going to use for standalone pieces of content. <laughs> There's also one or two topics which, like, it's in the news again because of very famous photographers getting involved with unethical wildlife photography practices. The, la the latest one now is foxes being fed, which is on the back of a whole bunch of other things. So there was a question about it this week. We're going to pause on that and maybe dig deeper on it in a future episode. Just need to do some research and homework. But some of the stuff that's out there is not right. Yeah. Simple as that. And, and I, think, I think it also gives the, the, the photographers or the, the photographic safari industry the, the, the wrong impression, you know. Sure. Um, for, for guides as well, I mean, we've often had, when we're on a vehicle, guides almost feeling under pressure because they think that we need to get the shot every single time. Mm. And if it's about that, if your photography is about that, then uh, you need to have a serious look at yourself because that's the experience and that's what we try and encourage people is the experience of, about, the experience of wildlife photography and wildlife viewing mm. and the enjoyment thereof is so much more than yeah. the images itself. And, and I think, like you said now, for me and for us at Wildlife, the thing that we say is, a trip should be about three things. Number one, a good experience. It's not about walking away with amazing images. It's experience first. 
of wildlife photography, of sitting around a fire, of looking for stuff, of falling asleep, listening to Africa experience. Second of all is new knowledges and skills about wildlife, about photography, about culture, about yourself. How deep is that? Yeah. And then you write that down. <laughs> you're right, write that down. And then you have good images. The problem is some of these famous photographers build themselves on images and they were unethical when they created them. They are creating a bad perception about everything. More on that in a future episode, I think. Yeah. Maybe a standalone piece of content, actually, because yeah. it's worth a talk. New yeah. people coming into the industry sees these things and they see it as normal. I think it's fine. I'm actually on the podcast, I'm interviewing um, Charlotte Rhodes. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? 16-year-old um, South African wildlife photographer from Durban. And I want to chat to her about these things. Yeah. Like, what's your challenge growing up as a wildlife photographer in Africa? What do you need more of? What do you want less of? What do you yeah. challenge? What do you think? Charlotte, if you're watching this, you can prep. I'm going to ask you this in the podcast. What do you think when you see stuff like that? Because yeah. it's not right. Yeah. Anyway. I think for all of you on, on Instagram, I mean, we've been following it for the last sort of day or two. And for those that, that stand up and have... Um, made your voices heard, I think, well done. I think it's, uh, we, need to, more of that. we need to highlight more of these things because it is a problem. You know, it, is, it is unacceptable and it's, um, we don't want that to happen. Mm -mm. Because, you know, at the end of the day, okay, a fox might not be the best example from a, from a dangerous animal point of view, but if this happens to like, some of these dangerous animals and, and um, you know, they get fed and used to people and something that happens, then it's the animal's fault, the animal's to blame. Mm. And, ends up getting shot. You know, that, that's often the, the reality of it. It's messed up. More to follow. Mm. Anyway, guys, that is episode 55 done. Um, thank you for all your questions. Mike's got a question there. Uh, Mike. Sorry, we're going we, <laughs> for the video. Mike, you've got a question for us. Mike's comment is the doll with an exploding face. Well, can he word me? Why does Judy complain about the laundry when your hand does it anyway? <laughs> so, so, so just to bring you guys up to speed, we'll cut back here. Mike has a question from the live session and saying, why does Judy complain about the washing when your hand does it anyway? Mike, that's, that's the struggle of my life at the moment. Mike, you're causing shit. <laughs> I'm not traveling anytime soon, so I might just have to own the couch for a little bit. <laughs> right. Guys, thank you so much for watching. Thanks for your questions. We are, and stay tuned, I think in future episodes we'll do the live thing as well. Yeah. Uh, we might stream them closer so you can ask live questions as well. But thank you for putting your questions out. If you have any questions right now about wildlife photography, our emails are at the bottom here. Hit us up also on Instagram. We will ask the week before. But it's fun. Anything goes. Like you see, washing. Anything goes. <laughs> Last thing from you. That's it. Thanks, Jerry. Thanks, uh, thanks for everyone for your questions. I think it's um, some really cool ones in there, really valuable. And yeah, I look forward to um, answering your questions again next week. That's it. We'll see you in the next episode. My name is Jerry. My name is Johan. We're from Wild Eye. Bye. Cheers.